Like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its suns away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. We're just reading chapter one, Mysteries of a Lost World. And this is the book we're reading today. We're going to get into this book today. Hope you guys enjoy it. Secret Cities of an Old South America. Written by Harold T. Wilkins from the Atlantis reprint series. Secret Cities of Old South America. Very interesting book we're about to get into. And even though a lot of this is very historic, we're also going to read this like a, you know, adventure book, a novel, like a story. Or, you know, he really goes into it, how he's, you know, going through the jungle and exploring like Indiana Jones. So I hope you guys enjoy this. All right. Secret Cities of Old South America. And again, we're in chapter one, Mysteries of a Lost World. Time like an ever rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Probably of no other country are these words of the famous Anglican hymn words of a poet, not a maker of pious dogger truer than of the lands of mysterious South America. Cradle of the dim, an ancient world's earliest civilization again did you hear that another person letting you know where's the true old world again south america what cradle of the dim and ancient ancient world's earliest civilizations that mighty continent over which the deep floods of time have rolled rolled as with the sounds of drum passing out from the despairing land to the boundless, headless, estranging ocean, sinking man and his culture into a depths with a bubbling groan, without a grave, to those not blinded by preconceived notions and le ide fix or a fixed idea of consecrated fallacies. This old continent and North and Central America have their sagas graved in petroglyphs in the weathered rocks of mysterious canyons. They are still small voices in desert places where say to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, not merely that man has existed on this planet thousands of years earlier than encyclopedia.
Orthopedic historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, ethnologists, and others of that ilk suppose or theorize. But that civilization itself on this ancient earth is something far more hoary than many's. Sanconiantum, Berosus, or the kings of summer in Acadia. The Hidricla expedition discovered ancient skulls showing compound fractures resulting from the savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting. You hear that? Hand-to-hand -hand combat, martial arts, ancient Peru. What are we talking about here? In prehistoric camps such as that of Breedon Hill Top in England or in the Nilotic regions where ancient Egyptians fought with the mysterious shepherd kings of the Hyksos or Shasu, similar injuries may be seen in the human remains unearthed from the campsite or on the skulls and trunks of some of the pharaohs. In the case of the Peruvian remains, some of these injuries or depressions of the crania had been inflicted by round or irregularly shaped stones hurled from a great distance with immense velocity by sling throwers. These prehistoric men in Peru, ancient Peru, were armed also with large wooden clubs, extremely hard, and in whose ends splints of copper or stone had been fastened. Such weapons seem to be the sort of described as macanas in certain old Spanish manuscripts, which I have translated and used in this book and in my preceding work on South America. These races also had hatchets, both of copper and stone. As is known, use and knowledge of certain metals ran side by side with the Stone Age technique of the Neolithic era in old Europe and, and certainly in South America. Surgical examinations further disclose a remarkable fact. These ancient races of Western South America had attained advanced medical knowledge in which they made use of a number of things unknown to us today. They also well knew of the dangers of free exposure of wounds to the open air. They also apparently recognized not only that sunlight and rays in the spectrum had the power of asepsis and sterilization, but that if a badly wounded man lay in the sunshine and bathed his injuries in the solar radiation, remarkable cures might be affected. These are Indian tribes in both Brazil and regions of Northwestern South America, who today both know and practice this sun cure technique of healing for terrible wounds. Their medicine men also recognized and discriminated between ague, rheumatism, fevers, cerebral disturbances, and mental aberration. Fragments of flint sharpened to a point were used for excising and bleeding, and flint sharpened on the edge played its part in their surgical operations. In their processes of mummification, the dead were treated very much as those of old Egypt. I do not know if any member of the Hidrikl expedition asked himself if these evidences of ancient technique and knowledge indicated the probable or possible existence of some extremely ancient and vanished civilization long preceding the age of the remains. It was not till 20 years later that a certain senor, who is the haciendero of Esmeraldas Ecuador, sent down divers of the coast who brought up from a drowned city, you hear this, a drowned city, off the foreshore of his estate statues of men and women of ancient Mongolian, Caucasian, and Egyptian type with mirrors and one is told even lenses, seals inscribed with hieroglyphics and pornographic relics. Such finds in themselves would be evidence of an advanced and extremely ancient and unknown civilization which had become decadent and which might or might not be Mu or Lemuria. Again, both in North Central and South America, there is a riddle of the petroglyphs, odysseys on the rock walls and cliffs and river canyons. Among these signs are some that are certainly not Amero-Indian pictographs of some race of nomad hunters. Rather, 
Are they signs that someone who passed that lone way thousands of years ago either had contact with ancient civilizations in the Americas or crystallized in the alien stone ancestral memories of such highly cultured races? It is now believed that the cavemen of prehistoric America, like those in Europe, carved objects in soapstone or painted figures on walls to help them in work in magic in their hunts for animals. Mountain sheep and other animals are recognizable in these early North American pictures and were probably painted for use in rites meant to increase the fertility of the hunted herds, helping their capture or hunting and so plentifully supply food. Other prehistoric pictures mark the sites of water holes, but as I have pointed out elsewhere in the book and in my previous volume on the mysteries of South America, there are quite other figures not explicable on these grounds. For example, there are moon-faced angular figures of human beings scratched as petroglyphs on rocks, some of which figures seem to represent dancers and ceremonial rites or deities. Some of these deities are garbed in a peculiar dress and suggest men of a very ancient civilized race whose megalithic cities have been found in Central America and lower Southern California and over the border in Baja California, as well as in South America, down to the Antiplanisi of the Argentina. Again in Nevada and Eastern California, explorers have found elaborately engraved or drawn figures which seem to be pictured puzzles. In some cases, these enigmatic devices have been found deeply buried under old mineral deposits. It is clear that they are extremely ancient pictures and their meaning has yet to be revealed and interpreted. Their true interpretation will probably result and a drastic recasting of present theories of orthodox archaeologists and anthropologists about the age of civilization in the Americas, okay? It was in that very region of the upper Rio Magdalena of the wooden foothills of the central Cordillera where it was remarked as a singular fact that the colossal statues of the men and women faced east in the direction of the rising sun that way lay the great island continent of lost Atlantis. Close to these excavations, there was also found a colossal stone table that 50 men exerting all their united strength could barely move an inch. This table was finely polished and set on four feet like claws, exquisitely fashioned by master craftsmen and springing from a single central shaft. There were other relics like ancient monuments of the Egyptian pharaohs. These bore vestiges of inscriptions and characters none could read. They too had been cut out of a single block of stone. In this same region of the upper Magdalena in the provinces of Tolima and Nueva Granada of Colombia, there have been found remains of giant men. Men one repeats, not bones of fossil mastodons, mammoths, or elephants, of which I shall have more to say later in a subsequent book, we pass on through the 19th century to the third decade of the 20th when the time spirit was again moved to raise a corner of the veil from this mystery of ancient South America. In the summer of 1931, an expedition was organized by Monsignor Federico Lu. Nardi of the Apostolic Nunciature of Bogota. I do not know if Monsignor Lunardi is a member of the Society of Just Jesus, but whatever may be said or thought of this order, their members are certainly distinguished by centuries of research and out of the way knowledge connected as well with archaeology and prehistory in South America, as with the most modern theories and applications of physical science. In particular, speaking as a research worker into this obscure and difficult branch of American prehistory, I would give a great deal to possess photostatic copies of the manuscripts in which Jesuit missionaries recorded their discoveries of unknown dead and ancient cities of gold and mystery in Brazil and Paraguay. 
as well as in Western and Northwestern South America from late 16th to the 18th century. The Monsignor found more remains of some unknown and extremely ancient and highly civilized race once inhabiting this region of ancient South America of a pre-cataclysmic age, all right, antediluvian. He says that the culture of this unknown race ranks with that of the mysterious races of the Mayas of Yucatan in Guatemala. Their ruins in the upper Magdalena territory lie in the little known and little explored region of San Agustin, deep in forests, jungles, and practically unknown mountains. The empire ruled by the great unknown extended so far as discoveries up to the present in port some 60 miles along the upper Rio Magdalena. It may be remembered that from this region of gold and mystery came to old Cartagena much of the gold laden into caravels and galleons for which the buccaneers of Barty, Sharps, and Morgan's days lay in wait beyond the Barra of Barramida. All right, all the gold they took out of here. I have a fragment of a manuscript of Cromwell's day in which some unknown English buccaneer speaks of the gold of this very region, when it may be expected and recommended in hardy English spirits and cutthroat blades of fortune of that picturesque day to go up river and get some of this gold from the source. But to return to the ancient unknown race, they built great canals for irrigation purposes, erected colossal statues which they cut from the living rock and transported by some means, apparently across high mountains from a great distance. Lunardi appears quite wrongly to suppose that the country in which the, these ruins are found has always been, as one sees it now. It is clear that many of these colossal statues have been carved to depict from the life the great men over whose tombs they were erected. The people in the remote Colombian village of San Agustin have actually erected some of these colossal statues of ancient men in their Catholic Capilla Plaza, and they uphold the marble figure of El Liberador Simón Bolívar in a park of San Bogotá. About these megalithic remains, there is more than a suggestion of strange monuments found in Easter Island and other Polynesian and Micronesian islands, such as Ponapi, Malden, Pitcairn and the Marquesas. Indeed, the ruins appear to antedate even the Andes, even the Andes. All right, so we continue a little further in the book. We got an account here from Monsignor Lunardi. Now he says, two glyphs, symbolos, appear on two of these San Agustin statues. One of them, perhaps a figure of a woman or a goddess. And one glyph is the stairway symbol of evolution from a central sun of the universe, perhaps an esoteric concept of the old people of Lemuria, or Mu, or Rutas. It appears on the neck behind the shoulder and is on both statues. These signs are found all over North and South America in ancient ceramics of the Pueblo Indians in the Southern states and Western states of the USA and Mexico. Also, it is found on one or more of the monoliths at Tijuanaku, the mysterious. The mystic sun must not be identified with demi orgos such as Brahma or Jehovah Jave, but perhaps with the Agnosto Teo, unknown god of the Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> All right. On Mars Hill at Athens, this sign also appears on the head of prehistoric statue of a woman found near Veracruz and now in the Belliner Museum for Volkerkunde. Maybe both these unknown races were Heliolithic older than 15,000 years ago and dating back to an age when there was a worldwide diffusion of sunstone culture from or to the old Mediterranean and Europe and to or from from America, from America, or the ancient Pacific. The peculiar dentition of the most farouche and savage looking of these strange statues of San Agustin, tusk projecting from the top jaw, is found not only in ancient Mayan and Mexican statues 
All right? Listen to this part right here. This comes back home for me. But on a stone head of prehistoric date with similar headgear to that of San Agustin dug up in the interior of Costa Rica. It is called the culture of the Huetar or Huetar. All right? In that country, the Huetar. I descend from the Huetar, part of my ancestry. If the Mayas of the first empire originated in the Andes of Northwest South America, they have inherited some of these rites and this symbolism from the culture of these San Agustin megalíticos. And this does make sense. Recently, I have come across that the uh, Huetar or Huetar, Huetar people here of Costa Rica might be related to the uh, South American Carib family, Caribana family. Continuous says, but I myself suspect that both derive from a far earlier and exceedingly brutal type of civilization found in ancient Mu or Lemuria. Continuing a little further down in the book, again, we're reading Secret Cities of Old South America. From my own scanty data, I shall say that these dead cities of old Brazil range west from the unexplored land far up in the Rio Huara on the Andean eastern foothills and the country of a tribe connected with the well-known Hivaro headhunters to the east in the mostly unexplored territory behind the Serra do Sincora in the Sertao of the province of Bahia on the north. More than one of them may be located far up the mysterious river Trombetas toward the Tumac Humac ranges on the frontiers of the Golden Guianas. One with gold and gems transcending the imagination of the old tale tellers of the Arabian Nights, which lies far up the other mysterious Rio Branco toward the Sierra de Parima. Both of these affluents of the Marañón or Amazon, the Marañón, the Anian Sea, shout out to 432, the drop, con drop with the drop, <laughs> the water, Amazon, the Marañón or the Mad Sea, right, of Anon, the Anon Sea, Anion. It's the same as the Amazon, are famed as being the last known treks of famous white fighting women, all right, Dutch the hijack. Beautiful affair, right, beautiful. The South American Amazons in the 17th century and early 18th century day when the tough banderistas of Sao Paulo and the valiant Spanish pioneers were pushing forward into the unknown from the side of Peru and what is now Ecuador and Goyas. To the southeast, another of these definitely Atlantean cities, Atlantis in America, Atlantean cities with moats, causeways, and megalithic structures is located in a spot called by the Indians Guaira. Guaira. Not many leagues from where flows the Rio Pequeti in Sao Paulo. Strange remains of megalithic walls and buildings, statuary of men and women, very ancient symbols and unknown letters and glyphs carved in caves and on cliff walls, lie in remote spots in mountains and on plateau and deep in woods, all the way from Seara and Marañão to Pernambuco and Rio de Janeiro. They have been seen by Hollanders in the early 16th century and by Portuguese and Brazilians and Indianistas in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Of them, I shall speak in a later book. Here is an account of one in a remote region of Brazilian Guiana, which I take from a travel diary of my own. I hear of a place where three streams unite and spread out in the waters of a large and deep lago or lake. I am told that some of the rare plucked uns among the New York 400 young men and pretty girls have visited this place. One knows when one is in the neighborhood for one hears coming through the aisles of the deep forest a roar of thunderous reverberations. It is one of the catadupas which frequently figure in the accounts of the travels of the hardy, valiant banderistas into the Jerais and the Goyas and the Mato Grosso in the 18th century. 
waters vanish over a lip of rock into a great cavity. Here a great hole yawns into the earth. Close by many great lichened and gray stone steps of very ancient stairway, half as old as time. Like the red rose city of Petraera. All right, they're finding ancient stairways here, right? Are cut in rock of black basalt. Reaching the bottom of this stairway, one is startled to find unknown glyphs, or as they seem to be ancient unknown letters, cut into the rock which is dank with spray of the fallen waters. One passes into the immense cavern, where the air is fresh and cool, that the roof is pierced with ancient ventilation shafts, as it might be of a great western railroad tunnel in the west of England. Inside the great cavern under an archway, one hears an underground stream roaring into the darkness, which is Stygian. No forest Indian will visit the place, but if one can obtain a canoe, one can paddle in the deep darkness to a point where the walls close in and the roof comes down, as in Edgar Allan Poe's pit and pendulum, in the dungeons of the old Dominican Inquisition in Toledo. In my previous book, Mysteries of Ancient South America, I said that the old Jesuit missioners expelled by the kings of Portugal and Spain, all right, expelled, why were they expelled from, were they really cryptos in the late 1770s from their Latin American dominions when Pope Ganganelli suppressed the order of San Ignatius Loyola in 1773, knew a lot about these dead cities of old Brazil. Indeed, at this moment, somewhere in the Great Vatican Library in Rome, there must be filled manuscripts written by these missioners, given many details of these strange cities, which the papal authorities may find it best to let lie, Purdue. Way back in faraway Germany, a savant, Christoph Gottlieb von Moore, von Moore, recorded in the year 1775-1799, many curious matters of ethnographical sort, which he derived from these expelled missioners. He somewhere says that Hunderfund in the upper Xingu heard that somewhere behind the dense jungles and forests were prehistoric ruined cities. It was of this mysterious region that Colonel Fawcett spoke when he said that a tribe of surprising degree of culture were ruled by matriarch of Amazon women who were probably the direct descendants of the very Amazons whom Sanchez and Sinophis and told Solon, the Athenian, formed part of the army of the latter Atlantean island of Poseidonis. All right, you hear what he's just said? This is the story of Atlantis, where Solon got it from, right? They're talking about the same people here. And we've done videos on the Amazons, the tales of the early Spaniards in the 1400s, 1500s, how... They were finding all these Amazonian women in the Amazon, like warrior women, right? In Martinique and also California, Queen Khalifa. We already know. It says here, there is a Mato Grosso Indian tradition still extend about a great and very ancient white ruler of old Brazil. All right, so Dash the Hijack. Of course, this author loves to add the white, all right, <laughs> who was a great cacique, ruling over 10 other chiefs of vassal tribes. This sounds remarkably like an echo of the Ten Kings, who periodically met and held state councils and religious festivals in the great golden temple of Poseidonian Atlantis. All right, they're saying it's the same thing. The Ten Kings, yeah, they're in South America. That's what he's saying. This is taken from Plato's dialogues of Timaus and Critias. The same Indians of the Mato Grosso and the Goyas as well as down south in the state of Sao Paulo, have traditions that a great cataclysm forced their ancestors to quit the shores of an ancient Marañón Amazon basin. Listen to this, an ancient Marañón, the Anian Sea, an ancient Marañón Amazon basin, where were located great cities of shining white stone, ruled over by powerful white chiefs, all right? White, fair, beautiful, all right? Dodge the hijack. I told you he likes that. The white in there. In a very far day. Even today, these Indians have a tradition that in the western Mato Grosso, as is now is, 
and on the side of the Gran Chaco of forests and swamps that borders Paraguay, Western Brazil and Bolivia, home by the way of at least one great monster of an amphibian dinosaur called the Bue Hagua, Hagua, Hawa, the great monster dinosaur Dracon, Hawa, <laughs> Bue Hagua. There was a prehistoric sea called O Charajes. This name is borne by one Indian tribe in the upper reaches of the Paraguay, contacted in 1723 by Capitao Antonio Pérez de Campos, and called by him a O Gentio Sarajes. The waters of this prehistoric sea, said to be older than the rise of the Andes, laved the slopes of the old Brazilian highlands on which the great megalithic cities were located and extended a good way southward to what is now the Argentina. All right? Vast empire here. We're talking about ancient times, ancient South America. A correspondent of mine in Sao Paulo tells me that It is known there by certain people that in the 1900s, when Colonel Fawcett was delimiting the frontiers of eastern Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil, he reached the country of the formidable Nambiquaras. These Indians are the subjects of jokes among other Indian tribes in Brazil by reason of the abnormal size of their viral organ. They are powerfully built and dark in hue. <laughs> Their viral organ. How you hear that? They are powerfully built and dark in hue, dark complexion, and maybe descendants of the very ancient black aborigines of South America. They are definitely of Stone Age culture. You hear that? Can I get a pull up? I'm gonna go back. I said these Indians. What again? They are powerfully built and dark in hue. And they are the descendants of the very ancient black, so-called black aborigines, original people of South America. They are definitely of Stone Age culture, ancient. Fawcett was told by a cacique of the Nambiquaras that a megalithic ancient city lay east of their country, towards the headwaters of the Rio Xingu. This dead city was hemmed in a bay by a belt of very dense forests be said with the fierce Suyas, a tribe of very savage Indians. The cacique gave to Fawcett, one is told, a pebble carved in intaglio with a figure of a sandaled man wearing a sort of ancient Roman toga. It was very ancient. Other stones were incised with letters like those found in AD 1745 by the old Bandeiristas who entered another dead Atlantean High Brazilian, Atlantean High Brazil, the legends of High Brazil from Ireland and the British Islands, considerably to the east of the Xingu country. These ruins of the Nambiquara Cacique are said to be in a plain encircled with range of blue mountains and with dense jungles and forests coming up to the massive walls. These are Moats and massive paved stone caseways and streets. It is very reminiscent of a dead city described in my mysteries of ancient South America. There were also tales of monstrous animals in this region, some of dinosaur type wallowing in reedy lakes and others oddly like the King Kong ape, all right, King Kong of the latter Edgar Wallace fantasies. 10 or 12 feet high with human-like hands instead of opposed thumbs. Mato Grosso and the adjoining province of Goyas contain many other strange reminders of the mysterious past of old Brazil. In the upper reaches of the Paraguay, about 200 miles southwest of Cuyaba, are megalithic remains of large square blocks piled on one another. On the side of Serra, between two rivers and close to the Lago de Jajaiba, are glyphs of the sun, moon, planets, snakes, imprints of hands and feet, and other curious symbols. Such glyphs are found in other regions of Central South America. They range from the foothills of the Chilean Andes right up to the Sierra de Santa Marta of modern Colombia, South America. All are very ancient and all are cut deeply in hard stone. In this region are miles of strange caves which call for exploration by experienced 
speleologists, for they have dangers in their recesses. All the Indians from the Coroados, Tonsure tribes to the Botucudos, who wear labyrinths of botoques, shell or bone ornaments speared through their lips, have ancient traditions of a great cataclysm that drowned all people and left only two persons alive. The Paresis, Indians in particular, have a dim tradition about great stone cities and of an old and bearded white missioner of culture, Hero, who ruled them and who was called Sukuchwe. It may be noted that the radical of this name is that of the dim Suhe or Sume, whose footprints have been found cut in hard immemorial rock all over Brazil and Paraguay. Opinion in the book Secret Cities of Old South America by Harold Wilkins. Opinion in the book, a little further on, it says here, as one has pointed out before, the Mato Grosso province of Brazil may hold the key to this riddle. In this vast and mostly unknown region are located the ancient Brazilian highlands, one of the first lands to emerge from the Archean Sea. And some 20,000 years ago, the seat of a very ancient white empire of Atlantean type, whose civilization and culture had in thousands of years before the great cataclysm of Solon, Plato, Sinophis, evolved from hieroglyphs to an alphabet and syllabary closely akin to the Phoenician Greek alphabet, all right? He's saying this because they found these glyphs there in the jungle. Now we're going to dodge the hijack again with the white. He keeps adding white to all the Atlantis stuff. Now he's going to contradict himself right now, like he did earlier. Because remember, he said the ancient people are the so-called black aborigines. Well, it says here this later alphabet in its turn as Diodorus Siculus hints, came from the motherland of Atlantis. Valuable European, English and American lives have been lost trying to answer this riddle. It is an answer which the gods of South America have so far willed shall not be given until white explorers pass beyond the dense zone of forest and equatorial swamps and force their way onto what is at present an inaccessible and extremely mysterious plateau. Its approaches are guarded by dwarfish black, so-called black troglodytes, armed with clubs and about as pleasant to encounter as must have been dangerous and savage submen of the Neanderthal age. These black aboriginals also found up the unknown headwater reaches of the unexplored Rio Huapis, which enters the province of Caqueta, Colombia, from northwestern Brazil, must be the world's oldest race, just as they are the earliest inhabitants of old Brazil. All right, the world's oldest race and the inhabitants of old Brazil, but they're just talking about white Atlanteans, right? So that's what I'm saying. He contradicts himself, right? In this unexplored territory of the Brazilian highlands, ranging between Rio Roosevelt and the Goya's tableland, there is an unknown region of 2 million square miles, where as geologists will agree is some of the first lands to emerge from the primeval sea. You hear this? Just like in Canada and just like the Maya, the first land out of the waters, America, all right? It's all over the Americas, you hear? It has probably never been submerged by any cataclysm. It has no sedimentary rocks, but only platonic rocks it says here some 50,000 and more years ago after the giant cordilleras of the Andes had been trussed up from the bed of the sea of the older Miocene age for the Andes are recent in geologic sense all right so they're saying the Andes you know the mountains are a lot younger like more new than the rest of the part of South America they're not as old as you know all the you know other parts of america they're saying south america consisted of a vast march about two million square miles in area which lay between new andean cordillera and the mato grosso what is called the modern brazilian highlands listen to this this land of high or royal brazil high royal brazil like the high plateau of arizona Nevada and Utah, Judah, Utah is one of the oldest, just like Utah, one of the oldest, just like Utah, one of the oldest, which has emerged from the primeval sea. Its first savage inhabitants were black as coal. You hear that again? The first what? The first inhabitants were what? So-called black. 
couple of colored tribes of America, so-called Negro, right? Where black as coal and their Negro kinsmen live in regions around the Orinoco and in parts of Central America, okay? Okay, we already got the drop on this from indigenous American to so-called African-American. It's just more correlation. These are the stories coming out of here. And this is what he's finding there, what he knows. He says this with certainty. Again, this is the land. Again, he's saying the first inhabitants of this area, this ancient, ancient area were uh, black as cold and their Negro kingsmen live in regions around the Orinoco and in parts of Central America. Brazil then formed a great island separated from the Andes by a vast region of flooded lakes and great marshes. The Andes were born of tremendous volcanism and was also the southern part of the ancient Brazilian island. I have spoken in my book, Mysteries of Ancient South America, of the giants who once ranged South America, as in the far-off age of the pre-Inca tribes. One tradition in ancient Mexico says that the Pyramid of Cholula, the Pyramid of Cholula, right, the biggest in the world, was built by an antediluvian man, the giant Chelhua, who emerged from the mountain of Tlaloc. He was the sun god of the cross, all right, the cross, symbol of coition and creation of the Atlanteans of old high Brazil, where Eden was, huh? Where he and his brothers had sought refuge from the great catastrophe that coincided with the ruin of the high and ancient civilization of the old Brazilian Iso and the submersion of the island continent of Poseidonis Atlantis of which Solon and after him Plato spoke in Hellenistic echoes of the records of the temples of Saiz and Heliopolis. In old Peru, the Quichuas, Peruvian Inca Indians say that the Pucaras, forts and prehistoric strongholds such as Chanchajillo and Quejantana, overlooking Lago de Titicaca near the pueblo of Vilcachico, were erected by giants before the sun shone. And when savage warrior tribes ranged all over pre Inca Peru, land of Vida, or the sun, Peru, be it noted, is a radical not found in Quichua, though in ancient white Brazil of the Atlanteans the name was Vida, sun exactly equivalent to the Ra. Of the Egyptians of the Pharaohs. How far the giants range in South America, we shall see in a moment. And of course, we got a future video on giants. Information I've been collecting all these years, you know, something we're going to get into. Was it taboo? Is it historic? Is it just missed?